Well, if you don't see a welcome already, welcome to the White House. There's a story we had in Hollywood about Cecil B. DeMille, the producer of all of those great historical spec spectacles. It was after the big earthquake in March 1933, and a famous actress of that time, Janet Gaynor, had been in one of the studio buildings when the quake began and all the shaking took place. And when it was over and the ground had stopped moving, she turned to a friend and said, I thought for a moment we dropped into one of those DeMille pictures. But that's just how I felt last week during the Moscow summit, dropped into a grand historical moment. I know that you have questions to ask about the summit, and I don't want to take too much time at the start, but I thought I'd quickly review what we set out to do and what we did. As you know, our relationship with the Soviets is like a table. It's built on four legs arms reduction, resolving of regional conflicts, improvement of human rights within the Soviet Union, and expansion of bilateral exchanges. The Soviets have indicated many times that they'd prefer that discussions be confined to the arms issues alone. But we believe that sustained improvement in relations can't rest stably on one leg. We saw what happened in the detente period of the early 70s. There were arms and trade agreements and what was billed as a general thaw but because of Soviet behavior in so many areas, these could not be sustained. Weapons are a sign of tensions, not a cause of them. I know all of you have heard me say this time and again, but let me repeat it here. Nations do not distrust each other because they're armed. They are armed because they distrust each other. And we began building our new relationship with the Soviets seven and a half years ago. Strengthening America's defenses was and is part of it. Our zero option proposal for intermediate range nuclear missiles was part of it, coupled with NATO's deployment of Pershing II and ground launched cruise missiles. It was a carrot and stick response to the highly destabilizing deployment of the Soviet INF missiles. Our policies regarding emigration from the Soviet Union, human rights problems, and the Soviet presence in a variety of third world conflicts were also aspects of it. Progress was stalled for a long time. The Soviets tested our resolve and that of our allies at the bargaining table and in the deployment of INF weapons. They also went through a series of leaders, none of whom lived long enough to change the long-standing Brezhnev era policies. That was one of my problems, my delay in getting started in dealings with the Soviet Union. They kept dying on me. <laughs> And now under Mr. Gorbachev, the Soviets have a leader who appears to want to change things and who may actually be able to change things. Internally, his promotion of perestroika and glasnost gives us hope. Although we remember that old American political adage, trust everybody, but cut the cards. <laughs> In foreign affairs, he's begun the withdrawal from Afghanistan and agreed to our zero option for INF something the Soviets spent a number of years denouncing. I hope you'll forgive me for saying this, but too often in the past, it's appeared to me that coverage of summits has been geared more to the hunt for headlines than to the realities of business. If there wasn't the blockbuster agreement, a summit was dismissed. In fact, each of my four meetings with Mr. Gorbachev has produced significant steps forward. Take just one area, reduction in the level of strategic arms. In Geneva, the General Secretary and I agreed on the concept of 50 percent reductions, and in Reykjavik, on numerical limits for warheads and delivery vehicles, in Washington, on intensive work to complete a START treaty, including comprehensive verification provisions building on those in the INF Treaty. And in Moscow, we moved forward in reaching an agreement on an experiment to approve, improve the verification of existing nuclear testing treaties, and another agreement on notification of strategic ballistic missile launches. I've heard repeated many times the old rule that you should never go to a summit unless everything has been fully scripted in advance. Well, as you might have guessed, I don't fully accept that. I can't tell you the shock I heard in the first time when they said that we should put out the statement in advance that we were going to finish the summit with. I believe that if relations between the United States and the Soviet Union are genuinely to improve, 
From time to time, the top leaders must step in and exercise leadership. They must agree on a common set of broad goals so that those under them have a clear and common green light to move forward. That's been the purpose and the accomplishment of these four summits. Today, we can say with caution that we may be entering a new era of U.S. and Soviet relations. It's been a long time coming, but unlike past improvements that saw only a brief day, I think this one when will have a broad and stable footing. If the Soviets want it to grow, it can and it will. And now, rather than going on, I know that you have questions that you want to ask and that I want to answer. Think of what a refreshing change this will be for me to hear someone shout a question and realize it's not Sam Donaldson. <laughs> <laughs> Fire, yes? I come close, Sam, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, background, at least. Uh, I'd like to ask you, with the administration coming to a close, and in your own mind and the mind of many others, so much accomplished at the summit, how are you going to prepare for the transition, whether it's Republican or Democratic administration, so that you can continue what you've started? And I have a follow-up I'd like to ask. Well. I'll be pretty handicapped if it goes one way, but if it goes the way I'd like it to go, George Bush, who's been a part of everything that we've accomplished in these several years, why I would want to, I would want to point out to my successor the things that we didn't get accomplished that are still needed, the improvement in the whole budgeting process, the line item veto and what it means. As a governor for eight years, I did 943 line item vetoes without ever being overridden once. And we left the state with a surplus, not a deficit. But uh, no, I'll, I'll want to be of help if I can. But there are a number of things that in these succeeding months we're still going to try to get forward. My follow-up is nothing is going to be accomplished in terms of an arms agreement without your support, even after you're out of office. Do you think there should be some kind of formalized relationship between yourself and the next president and next administration so that you can be privy to what's being prepared along the way? Well, let me say there is such a, there is such a situation or uh, arrangement now. Regularly, we keep each of the former presidents informed in writing with the policies and where we are and things like the, the summit and all of that. Uh, that goes on regularly, and they are, they're all kept completely informed, and I think that's all that a, pre that a president, an ex-president, should uh, ask for. Mr. President, Paul Lemon from KATU TV in Portland, Oregon. Uh, acknowledging that you are pleased with the progress made in Moscow and that your administration has stated that there is a possibility of agreement before your term ends, uh, will you press for that if it becomes realistic to include going so far as to invoking your powers to recall Congress for ratification? Oh, I wouldn't mind recalling them for anything. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, uh, no, the, the thing is, let me make clear that we have refrained from setting deadlines. I think the idea to set down some line and then you find yourself tempted to agree to something less good than it could be, but because of the deadline. So if it isn't, I'd, I'd think it'd be great if the START agreement could be uh, finished, uh, the negotiations go on uh, between our representatives. If that could be done before I left office and it could be signed, that'd be fine. Because then we could move on to some other things that uh, need dealing with conventional weapons and so forth. But if it isn't, why, we'll just keep on negotiating and then try to impress on whoever comes in next to where we are. Uh, I was, I've got to come over to this side here some, sometime. I, my name is Ted Trulock. I'm from WCTV in Tallahassee, Florida. We both went to Dixon High School <laughs> in yeah. Dixon, Illinois. Uh, anyway, sir, what I was going to ask you about was the Democratic side on the presidential politics. How do you see the Reverend Jackson's campaign? Do you think that he is a viable vice presidential candidate? Can you give us some advice? I'd like to follow up with you. Well, <laughs> I hate to give any suggestions that might be of help to the other side, but there's no question that he has uh, he has impressed a great, a great number of followers. Um, and I want to say, and without uh, any inference to any racial difference or anything, I would have to say that I find myself in, in great disagreement 
with policies that he has proposed, as well as those of the other candidate, Dukakis. But uh, I think that goes with the game, that uh, they obviously have different uh, goals in mind than, than we have. But um, I think he's, a, he's certainly been a viable candidate all the way. And, having some problems in California. What can you do to help him there? Everything I can. I've had to be neutral for a long time until uh, there was a definite candidate, because in this job you're a titular head of the party, so you have to remain neutral. But uh, uh, as I say, he's been a part of everything that we've accomplished in, in this administration. And, uh, and lady. What is your impression of Sharon Crockett from LAC Radio in Nashville? What is your impression of the people of the Soviet Union? Just the regular people? Uh, my opinion of the... The people. Just the plain old everyday working people in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union. Yes. There are several people at my table here that are going to have to listen again. <laughs> One of the most exciting things. I couldn't believe it. After all the years of propaganda that we're all villains on this side of the ocean and everything, the Soviet people were the warmest, friendliest, nicest people you could ever meet. Uh, every place we went, whether night or day, the streets would be lined with thousands of them as if there was going to be a parade. And their friendly waves, and then in the opportunities when we did have a chance to get out on the street and, and come in contact with them, and they all wanted to shake hands and, and, uh, and visit, uh, they were really wonderful. And I'm going to add something in there that you didn't ask, but that I had said once before up here. I voiced this a few times while I was, when I had a chance publicly in the Soviet Union, that not only were they all so wonderful and friendly, but I think the women of the Soviet Union are the biggest and most powerful stabilizing force in that society. They're just wonderful. Well, and then I'll get back over there in a minute. Mr. President, my name is Cameron Harper. I'm from KTVK Television in Phoenix. And I've heard you say in speeches that the summit was a turning point in East-West affairs, and you said that it planted the seeds of freedom and liberty. Vice President George Bush, as recently as yesterday, was saying that he's not so sure, that he's not sure it represents a fundamental change in direction for the Soviet Union and its relations with this country. Is he reading a, a different set of briefing papers, perhaps? No, and I think he's being as careful as we all must be. Um, it's all right to be optimistic and all of that, but I, I'm not a linguist, but I learned a Russian proverb, and Gorbachev wishes to hell I hadn't. <laughs> uh, it is dovoyai no provoyai. It means trust, but verify. And we have the greatest verification worked out in the INF Treaty that's ever taken place. There will be, I think, 60-some Americans permanently stationed in the Soviet Union, and they will have as many of theirs permanently stationed here. And that's never been attempted in any treaties before. There's a young lady there. Here. Mr. President, uh, you know Mikhail Gorbachev probably better than any American. have had four summits with him, spent many hours one-on-one -on -one with him. If he has the good fortune to have your good health and stamina, he could conceivably be the Secretary General for 20, 25 years. I'd like first your impressions of the man and any advice you might offer to the next president on going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mikhail Gorbachev. Well, I have, uh, I have known a number of their leaders and met with a number of their leaders uh, before. And I must say, this, uh, he is different. And uh, this doesn't mean, I mean, that, that you lower your guard precipitately at all, but he definitely, uh, his perestroika, and I read his book, uh, and glasnost, he definitely wants changes in the social structure there. And he's faced with a great economic problem, literally a basket case, and he has plans, and these plans, or the things, these other things I've just mentioned, are part of his plan for trying to uh, build up the economy and make it more viable than it presently is. And I have to, uh, I have to say that I, I think the Russian people uh, have taken uh, to both of these Glasnost and Perestroika, and uh, have a far 
better feeling about their system. Uh, I didn't run into the kind of cynicism that I've seen so often in the past am among them. And uh, I think he, I think that Margaret Thatcher was right when she said uh, he's someone you can do business with. Howard Caldwell from Indianapolis, Indiana. In light of the heavy coverage of the summit, I'm curious why you invited us out here today. Were you dissatisfied with that coverage? <laughs> <laughs> no, let me tell you, we've gone too long without people like you being here. Uh, I started in the beginning, having uh, several times a year, people like yourselves from all over the country here in this same room and doing what we're doing right now because I recognize that uh, your only sources of information were coming from uh, certain elements of the press within the Beltway and in the East here, and uh, uh, I sometimes have found some of those sources biased. And uh, I thought that you had a right to be able to ask, and you ask good questions too. Young, this young lady here, and then I'll, then I'll get you. That was asked of you earlier. I'm Nancy Chandler from WITI TV in Milwaukee. I'm wondering, with the approaching election, you knowing Gorbachev, if you had talked at all, certainly we know your preference in the presidential race. If he had expressed one way or another which candidate he might appreciate negotiating with in the future. No, I think he's been very careful to not ever get into that subject, and he's never he's never brought that up or not. But I've made it plain to him that I'm going to do everything I can to. Uh, impress upon my successor uh, where we are and uh, and what the goal should continue to be. Now that young man, I... Yeah. President, uh, some remarks you made in Moscow uh, caused great consternation among Indian leaders. Uh, one of the kinder assessments was by Navajo Tribal Chairman Peter McDonald, who happens to be a Republican and suggested it might behoove you to visit the Navajo Reservation this fall. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have any regrets about the remarks you made about American Indians in Moscow and uh, what the chances are of you visiting the Navajo Reservation this fall. Well, I don't know whether I can, what the, whether the schedule will permit. I'm still trying to find the fellow that tells me what I'm going to be doing every 15 minutes every day. But um, no, I don't, I don't regret that. And I, I do think that there were mistakes made back in the very beginning of our country with regard to uh, the Indians and the manner of handling them. But um, the question that I was answering was in effect, was that somehow I had refused to meet with, and I've never refused to meet with any Americans, and certainly haven't refused to, uh, uh, to meet with them, and, and have on a number of occasions. And uh, I don't know just what the specific complaint is, but I know that we, uh, we've been doing for a long time our utmost to provide education for those who wanted to maintain Indian life as it was on the reservation in contrast to those who leave and come out and join the rest of us and uh, become more like us. i got to turn back this way again. May I go back here once and then I'll come to you. Mr. Reagan, Steve Rondonero, WESH Television, Orlando. Thank you for having us for lunch. Enjoy the finger bowls. <laughs> Our area covers the Kennedy Space Center. We follow space very closely and paid a lot of attention to Mr. Gorbachev's first motions about a joint mission to Mars. Did you weigh that prospect at all? Do you see that happening? And how do you view our space program as opposed to where there is? is? They just put three cosmonauts up yesterday. Yes. There's no question but that the challenge of tragedy has put us behind. And we are back of where our schedule called for, but because we wanted to be uh, underway on a space station by this time. Uh, on, with regard to the uh, Mars trip, incidentally, we've already sent a craft to Mars, as you know, in the past, taken some pictures that make you wonder why anyone would want to go there. Uh, <laughs> but they've specified theirs would be unmanned also. I have turned that over to our people in that field. Uh, because I don't know just exactly what the scheduling problems are for getting us back into operation again and uh, whether that would set us back. But I was, I'm going to wait for their reporting before making a decision on whether we do something jointly. Yeah, space station already. I know you yeah. wanted to have ours out there by 1990 originally. Yeah. Do you have a money battle to, to make that happen? Will that become reality? Well, 
as I say, we were set back by that tragedy and then the extensive research and all that went on so that we wouldn't have a repeat. And uh, so we're, we're behind, there's no question, we're behind schedule in all of our space activity, other than the things that we put aloft, such as the satellites that can uh, give us the weather and that can photograph the Earth as if they were <laughs> just on the second floor and so forth, that type of thing. But generally, we are behind schedule. And uh, right now, uh, I understand we're having a little problem uh, since the explosion in one of our uh, rocket fuel plants. Uh, we're, we're having trouble. But, uh, yeah. Mr. President, Bill Byer from Miami. Uh, you're coming to Miami later this month, I understand. Uh, but the, some of the Cuban-American community and many of the people down there say that the Reagan administration has betrayed us. You've heard this, of course. Yeah. What's your answer to this? And of course, uh, betrayal is a very provocative word, but nonetheless, it's bounced around the headlines all over the country. What would you answer them? And then I have a follow -up. I would answer that they're misinformed. We certainly haven't betrayed them, nor is there anything to this idea that we've softened up our relationship with Castro. Uh, as you know, we were instrumental. And in fact, I would think that we were the ones that got the United Nations to uh, authorize a team to go to Castro or to Cuba and look into the charges of violation of human rights there. So no, we're not doing anything of that kind. I am since, uh, uh, since Cardinal O'Connor went down there, if it is true that he is going to release several hundred of their political prisoners, I have firsthand knowledge of what those prisoners have been going through and some of them for more than 20 years and the torture that they've gone through. But before I would take Castro's word as to the number and that he's releasing the bulk of them, only a few, no, I'd want somebody else to be there counting. The, the subject of the backyard, the Caribbean and, and South America come up during the Moscow summit at all? That well, cancer of communism seeping through? We, we always bring that up. In, in connection with that one thing about uh, uh, regional activities and regional developments. Uh, you don't get definite, specific yes and no answers to things. We, we think that there is a big improvement, the Afghanistan thing that has happened. We think that uh, uh, there is a, a probability, uh, maybe I should say possibility, but I believe even a probability of uh, now relief in Angola from the same kind of a situation, but yes, they know our feelings, and we have laid out the places where, where we believe that something must be done. Mr. President, oh. uh, Ray Bream of ABC Talk Radio, Los Angeles. And uh, first of all, as a member of the Rotary Club of Pacific Palisades, we know you're an honorary member, and after January, we invite you back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, regarding SDI, a few months ago, you said that. The Soviets may be preparing to break out of the ABM treaty and deploy a nationwide ABM system. Did you talk that over with Mr. Gorbachev, and what was his answer? Well, we've told him that we believe that, they've, that they're in violation. We know they're in violation of the ABM treaty, particularly with Krasnoyarsk. And we've made it plain that we know that, and that that is going to be factored in in any of our, any of our dealings, and particularly with SDI. We know that they have been spending far more on defensive programs than we have with SDI. But evidently, their technology must not have kept pace with ours, because our system is one that I think, in spite of some of the pessimists who claim otherwise, that it is a research program aimed at a target. And the research has, there have been a number of breakthroughs that has made most of our scientists uh, optimistic that it is a system that can work. And if it can, I have often said, uh, and have said to General Secretary Gorbachev, that this could be the answer to the dreams, the dream of no more nuclear weapons, if we could make them obsolete with this kind of defensive system. And I have said, that I would be pleased to share it with the world if we had such a thing, because someday 
you know, we know how to make those nuclear missiles. And someday there could uh, be a madman come along, another Hitler or something, and try to blackmail the Earth. But not if we kept the, if we all had a protective system against them that was almost invulnerable. And we're very optimistic about it. There's, did you mean that one or that? There was one that I was going to take right back there with his hand up. Wayne Weinberg with WBBO Radio in Orlando. If I could play what if, a game of what if with you. If I were the vice president, if I were George Bush and we were in the Oval Office and there were just you and I, and I said, gee, Mr. President, all the polls show that I'm behind my caucus, what would you do to give him perhaps to buy some strategy to, re to reverse that? I'd say, George, wait till you and I get out there on the trail and start pinning him down on the things he claims, which we know are not true. And uh, then we would say such things as some of our own accomplishments. Uh, you know, if I listened to him long enough, I would be convinced that we're in an economic downturn and that people are homeless and people are going without food and uh, medical attention and, uh, and that we've got to do something about the unemployed. Do you know what the potential pool of employment is in the United States? I didn't until I got here. It is everyone, male and female, 16 years of age and up. That is the potential employment pool. All of those students, all of those retired people, everything. Today, the highest percentage of that pool is employed than ever in our history. There were other things we wanted to do. We wanted to get the government to act a little bit more like business and do things more effectively and efficiently than it can. I put George Bush in charge of a task force to see how many federal regulations could be eliminated. The book containing those regulations now is only half as big as it was when we came. And our estimate is that the people, the communities, the states, and businesses have now been able to reduce the amount of time spent on government-required paperwork by 600 million man-hours a year. And there are other little items, like just the other day some figures came in, that it uh, used to take 43 days to get a passport. It only takes 10 now. And there's one that used to take 100 days to uh, get a urban renewal loan uh, set, set in motion. And uh, it doesn't take 100 days anymore. It takes about 16. I can't, I may be getting some of these figures inaccurate, but that's how much the improvement has come in business-like ways and things that we've done to imitate business instead of uh, attack business. Now, I know that I'm way past my schedule, and uh, Elizabeth isn't, she's going to hit me over the head if I don't say it. There's one thing that's typical of this as well as the regular press conferences. And that is that, darn it, I always have to walk away with about 30 hands that have been waving that I haven't been able to get to. I just try to point in directions here and uh, not play any favorites. And since, since you're all new to me, uh, I couldn't play any favorites. But I'm grateful for your being here. And maybe if you, if you feel like writing some, some questions and handing them to our people, we can send you back some answers. We didn't get to, uh, to them at all. But I have to get back to the office now. Thank you all very much. Thank you.